We thought 80 people were coming today, but there's a few more than 80, obviously. That's good. So today's discussion is the human soul, and this time we're focusing on emotions of self-deception. The emotions of self-deception are the emotions that you create and manufacture. So we're going to look through these kind of emotions because they are one of the biggest impediments to your own spiritual progress. So remember, right from our early discussions, there's this law that God has created called the law of cause and effect. And if we have causes within us emotionally as to why we can't connect to God, God can only help us address those causes. God doesn't address effects. What that means is that if there is something inside of us that causes us to do certain things, and those certain things are the results of the emotions inside of us, while I'm in denial of the emotion inside of me, I will not be able to connect to God and also, God can't specifically, directly help me release the causal emotion because I'm unwilling to access it. I'm using my free will in order to get away from my emotion. And so today's talk is going to be focusing on how we can determine the difference between the actual causal emotions inside of us that prevent our connection with God and the emotions that we create or manufacture in order to deceive ourselves as to our own true condition. Now, in the first century, a lot of times we talked about these emotions of self-deceptions. In fact, many of you will remember some comments in the Bible about things like when I talked to Pharisees and said they were like hypocrites, like whitewashed graves, that inside they were full of dead men's bones, but outside they looked all nice and pretty. And this is a common thing that we do to ourselves all the time. What we do to ourselves is we, we want to see ourselves in this nice positive way. We want to see ourselves as if we're a good person and we want to see ourselves as if you know, we've got everything together and we want to see ourselves that we're intelligent. We want to see ourselves in all these different... And we could list a long list of all these different ways in which we want to see ourselves. But the problem is that often we don't see ourselves truthfully. And remember, what I've always been talking about over the last 18 months is that you need to see yourself as God sees you if you're going to connect to God. Does that make sense? You need to see yourself as God sees you. Now, if you can't see yourself as God sees you, then what finishes up happening is that we can't really connect to God. Now, we need to have a willingness to see all the things that God sees in us. Now, all the things that God sees in us that are beautiful, we need to be willing to see. Most of us, and many of us, because of unworthy emotions and other types of emotions on earth, we're not even willing to see those things, are we? A lot of times. So somebody tells us something nice about ourselves, what do we finish up doing? Oh, no, that's not true. Oh, no, I can't believe that. You know, we go down that track when somebody tells us something nice about ourselves. But also on the opposite end, when we see our law of attraction bringing us certain events or we see other people talking to us in certain ways, what, what we finish up doing is attracting certain events into our life that start exposing underlying emotions within us that are quite uh, harmful to us. So as that occurs, what happens is we start seeing negative things within ourselves. We start seeing things within ourselves that don't feel so nice. And usually what do we do with that? We try to ignore that or run away from that or we try to disown it. Right? And often I talked about this man looking in the mirror, seeing his own reflection, seeing all the lines and wrinkles, then turning away and forgetting completely what he just saw. And that's what we often do emotionally. What we do emotionally is the law of attraction or other events bring us certain emotions and then what we do is we just turn away from that because we can't bear to see that particular thing about ourselves. So today, I want you to bear in mind a few things in our discussion. Firstly, when I'm focusing on emotions of self-deception, most people at some point get quite upset. Now, the reason why they get upset is because, you know, we're, we're so used to trying to avoid these emotions and we don't like to be called on them. We don't like to, them to be shown up inside of ourselves because they're our own tools of avoidance. So whenever they're shown up, 
on a, and we see them. It's like a light being shine on our soul and we see all of these little tiny bits and pieces within us that are dirty or dark. We don't want to face those things and so what we try to do is cover them up. And so anybody who's shining a light on your soul in that particular area will naturally be the subject of your anger when you try to do that. Does that make sense? So this is why many finish up having myself as the focal point of their anger. Remember, your anger is your emotion covering over deeper emotions within you. That is the case. So whenever you're angry with me, all you're doing is denying that there's an emotion in, in you that's disharmonious with love. And the same applies, of course, with me if I get angry with you. It's exactly the same principle. Now, in all of these things, I want you to remember that I love you dearly and this is all a part of becoming at one with God. It's all about the progression towards where we are now, towards this space of being at one with God. Going through that transition of the new birth and into at one with God where you are, and you can feel God's emotions about every subject that you feel about. That's what it's about and being in that state of perfect love. Now, to get from where I am now to the state of perfect love is going to require lots of honesty inside of myself. And it's usually that particular problem that we all face, the fact that we don't always like to be honest about ourselves. We often have no trouble being honest with someone else, <laughs> right? That's pretty easy most of the time. We don't like this about you, we don't like that about I really like this about you. But, but when it comes to looking at ourselves honestly, and then even greater than that, when it comes to looking at ourselves as God sees us honestly, that becomes a very, very difficult process. So I'd like you to, rem to, to remember during this talk today that I'm not saying things... About, I'll be bringing up examples. Firstly, I'll be bringing up examples of my own self-deception. <coughs> then, then Mary is going to bring up some examples of her own self-deception. And then what we're going to do is pull off of the internet off of some public forums that some of you have been posting on your own, inter own self-deception. Does that make sense? And start to expose some of these self-deceiving emotions. Karen, you have a question? Maybe if I could have a mic with... I'm sorry if you were going to cover this anyway, but um, for, for months, the only thing that confuses me about what you teach is what you've just talked about. You know, you, you look at yourself and you see things that are wrong, not good about you. Yep. But then you say, if you feel unworthy, then God doesn't want to know about you because you're in disharmony with God. Yep. So how can you look at yourself and not feel unworthy? You may, you will at times look at yourself and feel unworthy. But the thing is to actually feel the emotion of unworthiness and its underlying cause. All emotions of unworthiness have underlying causes. And you need to be able to access those underlying causes. The emotion of unworthiness is often an emotion of self-deception. Does that make sense to everyone? The reason why, it actually takes you away from feeling the underlying emotion that created it. So one of, one of the things we'll be doing today, and if, if you ask these questions maybe later in the, in the day, one of the things we'll be doing today is how to actually recognise that I'm in an emotion of self-deception. And how to actually recognise when that emotion is taking me away from original causes. Now in the case of this emotion of unworthiness, for example, that you've mentioned, I've often felt the emotion of unworthiness, but it's actually been an emotion of self-deception in me many times. I'll give you an example. If you have an emotion of self-deception of unworthiness, it actually allows you to get away with not doing something that's quite powerful. For example, let's say you need to act upon a certain thing that's in truth and you know and you have a desire within yourself that you want to do that particular thing. Often the emotion of unworthiness comes up then in order to stop you from actually doing that thing. So often the emotion of unworthiness can actually be a self-deceiving emotion. It's in a way that you can avoid acting in truth. And so what we need to do, and we'll do this later in our discussion, is focus on how these emotions, how we can recognise that they're self-deceiving emotions versus how we can recognise they're actual emotions. Because it's the causal emotions that God is interested in clearing away from us. God isn't interested in clearing away from you all of your self-deception 
unless you want to actually see your self-deception. Does that make sense? And so the, the key is to recognize that almost every single emotion most of us experience could easily be an emotion of self-deception or it could be a real emotion, a causal emotion from our childhood. The key is what does it accomplish? For many, and you'll see later in our discussion that emotions of self-deception accomplish getting you out of things, helping you avoid things. That's what they accomplish. And that's why we need to talk a lot more about them. Does that make sense? Helga, I uh, have to do a mic, Helga. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We want to record everything. <laughs> Um, I don't understand. Where does this, right where does the self-deception emotion come from? The self-deception's emotions always come from the avoidance of pain, and we'll actually talk about that in our presentation. I mean, where do they get created? Inside of yourself, from yourself, in a desire to avoid your own deeper pain. Okay. In other words, we often will have an emotion that is a painful emotion, but not as bad as the core emotion. And it's more preferable for us to feel the painful emotion that's not so bad as the core emotion in order to avoid the core emotion. Does that make sense? Because most of us spend a lot of our life avoiding the pain that we actually feel inside of ourselves. And if you avoid anything with inside of yourself, you're disconnecting from God. So you can't avoid things inside of yourself if you want a full connection, at like 24 by 7 connection with God. So we actually create close, that emotion. Mic close. You need the mic We close. create that emotion on the spot. It's not something that is within us? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you can actually stay in these emotions for years. I, I've, I'll give you an example later where I stayed in an effect-based motion of self-deception for seven years. I cried three hours a day for seven years. Uh, if you can imagine that. One emotion, three hours a day, seven years and I still had it at the end of it. Why? Because I was just deceiving myself with the entire thing. So what I'm doing is showing you these things so that you can avoid all that process. Most, most people finish up getting to the point where we're often in cyclic emotions, where we feel like we're doing the same thing over and over and over again. How many of you feel like that now that you've begun your emotional processing, right? Where you feel like, oh, it's the same thing again, it's the same thing again, it's the same, same law of attraction is happening, same thing is happening. Well, yes, it probably is the same thing happening again, and it's an emotion of self-deception. There's something underneath it that we need to access, and we're creating this emotion in order to avoid what's underneath it. And this is one of the things we'll talk about in the talk uh, that we'll be presenting. So if you look at... Uh, the outline, you notice the topics of the outline that we've listed. Why discuss emotions of self-deception? The primary reason why is because God only addresses emotional causes within us and so emotions of self-deception aren't causal emotions and so God can't assist you in processing them in the normal way that I've taught you already. The reason why is because you're creating them and their effects. So God only focuses on helping you with causes. Now, I'm not saying that he doesn't help you with these emotions. What I'm saying is he can't help you process the emotion. Do, do you see the difference? The way that he can help you with these emotions is you can have a longing for you in your heart, uh, inside of you, for God to f show you when you're in self-deception, and God will use everything in her power to demonstrate to you when you're in self-deception. Now, those things that are in her power are all of your law of attraction, all of the angelic forces, if you like, in the spirit world are all there just to help you fi find these things. And then every single person on earth who can be influenced in some way to tell you a truth is also another way that God uses to help you identify these emotions of self-deception. But God can't, because of your free will, reach in and grab the emotion of self-deception and pull it out of you for a number of different reasons. Firstly, she would be harming your free will if she did it. Secondly, you're creating it and it's not a causal emotion. And God has a law called the law of cause and effect that only allows the dealing of causes. And so God deals with causal emotion only. You can see that if God dealt with effects, what would be happening is God would be running around clearing up all of our messes after us. And obviously, that's not what God does. God's waiting for ourselves to clear up our own messes by coming to the realisation of how 
we created our own mess. Does that make sense to everyone? So what we need to do is learn how we created our own mess and then also learn how we're avoiding the results of our own mess. And that, uh, that is this group of emotions called emotions of self-deception. So that's the main reason why we need to discuss it. Reminders about the soul. Well, most of you remember, and uh, I'm well prepared today. I've got all of these. Oh, there they are. Got all these whiteboard markers. So most of you remember um, the soul itself and what's happening with the soul. So what's the basics of the soul? Here's our soul. Our soul is our passions, desires, intentions, emotions, somebody said, lots of you said, and so forth, right? All of these, part, all of these things are a part of our soul. Now, our soul has two primary influences. What are those primary influences upon it in terms of emotional influences? That's right. So truth is one influence and error is the other influence. Now, obviously, everything harmonious with truth is loving. Everything harmonious with error is unloving. So... You could also say that the error-based souls, the emotions are always based on fears or things that we think are true but are actually false. False expectations appearing real to us. So these are the influences on our soul. So in our soul then gets all of this baggage, if you like. Every one of us get this baggage soaking in from the time we incarnate onwards. So from the time the soul attaches itself to the two bodies that are created, the spirit and material bodies, from the time the soul does that, the soul is soaking in the experience of those two bodies. Does that make sense? Soaking in those experiences and they affect all of my passions, they affect all of my desires, they affect all of my emotions, many of them into me emotionally. But there are also whole sets of, you could call them beliefs, which are emotional beliefs that I believe with a passion but actually, from God's perspective, they're not true. But I believe them to be true. And all of these things now affect my interactions. Now, when we start connecting with God, remember we've got God's soul. So this is God's soul. And God's soul is connecting to us via this connection with, through the Holy Spirit, which is the conduit, if you like, that's between God and yourself that allows divine love to flow to, into your soul. Now, as the divine love flows into your soul, these desires, passions and intentions and emotions inside of your soul start getting triggered. They start getting triggered in lots of different ways, like the love enters and then all of a sudden the love has to stop entering because we're now in a state of untruth. When we're in a state of untruth, we disconnect from the Holy Spirit, so therefore the divine love can't flow through us anymore in that state. And now we're in a state of we've received a certain amount of divine love, we can't receive any more until we use our own will to actually remove from within us an emotion or a passion or desire or a belief that's disharmonious with the love that is about to enter us. So, for example, if I had an emotion inside of me that caused me to get into a rageful state, and, and also this emotion may even at times make me feel murderous. I may not even murder, but it may be this emotion of murderous emotion inside of me. Now, obviously, I can receive a certain amount of divine love until this emotion gets exposed. And then while that emotion is there, if I'm unwilling to release it, if I'm unwilling to feel its cause, then I'll stay in that state, and I may stay in that state for many years. In fact, there's many spirits in the hells of the spirit world who have stayed in this state for hundreds of th or thousands of years, stayed in a murderous state, which is why, why we get so much evil spirit activity here on earth, because we've got these spirits who are still in this murderous state, and there's this emotion in their soul that they're unwilling to release, they're unwilling to let go of. So, we have God trying to give us her love, 
We have ourselves blocking the flow of that love by choices that we're making based on all of these different emotional things that exist in our soul that are actually preventing divine love from flowing because we're yet to release our emotions. So we learn that after a while and many of you have already learned that this is the process that goes on. So then we start looking at ourselves and we start seeing ourselves for what we really are. And we go, wow, like I didn't realize, but actually, you know, every second day I'm at work, I look at a woman and I feel like well, I want to have sex with her and she's not my wife. <coughs> Wow, like what's going on there, right? Or wow, like today I was in a rage with my boss, you know, like he told me to do something and it just triggered something inside of me and before I knew it, I was about to fly off the handle at him. And I had to go away and maybe get out the cigarettes and calm myself down or something in order to get away from that emotion. So we start noticing ourselves feeling this group of emotions that we in the past would have judged as really negative, bad emotions that we've got to avoid. We know they're in us. We're carrying them around. The law of attraction has exposed them to us. We're carrying around these emotions. So we start realizing we've got to actually connect with them and release them, right? But the problem is, is this block of causal emotion is often covered over with a block of capping or blocking type emotions and that's often covered over with a lot of law of compensation type emotions or karmic type emotions and that's often covered over with all of these emotions of self-deception. So if we look at how the emotions get created, what often happens, and I'll work from the bottom up if you like, so that when we look at the undoing of the process we have to go from the top down, so right at the bottom is my parents or my environment, someone in my environment when I was very, very young denied the emotional expression of an emotion inside of themselves. So let's say my parent has a rage towards the opposite sex. My parent, let's say, let's say in this case it's my mother and she has a rage towards men because men in her life treated her badly, her father treated her badly, maybe her father even abused her and then other men have treated her badly through her life. So she's got this rage towards men sitting in her soul. And she denies it. She shuts it down. She doesn't allow it to be released. Right? And we've talked all about emotional release and how you do that positively and all those kind of things, so I won't have that discussion here. But she doesn't want to release the emotion. So she shuts it down. Every single person in her environment is going to feel that emotion to its maximum amount. So you can think of it like when I shut down the flow of an emotion in my soul, I'm now storing this emotion inside of my soul. And my soul is like a great big radio antenna, emitting all of this stuff out to the universe that it doesn't actually feel for itself. Right? So my soul is now pushing out all of this emotion into the universe every single person in my environment is going to feel that I'm in a rage with men, whether I intellectually admit it or not. Does that make sense? So right at that moment, so we'll say in the case we're giving, mum denies her anger with men. Let's say I'm the female child of this mother. I'm going to get absorbed into me all of this rage that mum has towards men. So remember I've talked in the parenting discussion about how I will then act out that anger towards men. So here I'm a little girl, maybe two or three years of age, and every little boy that comes along, I bop him in the nose. You've seen this happen, right? Like where the, the, the little girl won't bop a little, another little girl in the nose, but she wants to bop every little boy in the nose. Like she just has this interaction. All she's doing is reflecting her mother's denied emotion. Right? So the child acts out the denied emotion. Or in this case, the denied anger. The child's now acting it out. Now, if that was your child acting out this denied emotion, 
She's three years old and she's now going to kindy, or four years old, she's now going to kindergarten. And she, you, she comes home and the, the kindergarten teacher brings her home <laughs> or comes up to you and says, look, today, you know, your daughter again slogged that little boy <laughs> that your daughter just does not seem to like, right? Um, and then a week later you sit down and you have your talk to your daughter, which is obviously not a very productive thing because you're denying your own emotion. <laughs> but anyway, you sit down and have a talk to your little daughter, hoping that it's all resolved. Next week, kindergarten teacher comes up to you again. Uh, we've got to do something about your daughter because she's now bopped that little boy again. Right? And so forth. All the child is doing is acting out the denied emotion of a parent. Now, the parent can easily solve this. The way the parent can solve it is by feeling her own anger towards men and actually finding what the underlying emotions are towards men and processing those emotionally without harming another person. When she does that, the child won't need to act out any emotion. Does that make sense to everyone? But most parents don't do that. What do they do? They stop the child from acting out the denied parental emotion. So what do they do? The parent suppresses is that the right spelling the child emotion the child's emotion can you see what happens there now this emotion of anger towards little boys in this child's case gets stored in her because it's no longer being released right the sad thing is that it wouldn't even need her to have been released if the mother actually released her own emotion. Right? So none of this would have happened if the mother released her own emotion. But the mother denies her own emotion, so the little child acts out the emotion, and then the parent suppresses that emotion inside of the child. Now the child's got two emotions. It's got the causal reason why it's acting out the parent's denied emotion happening, and it's also then got the emotion of suppression that occurs which is now the block to actually feeling her emotion. So the poor little child then still feels in this anger towards little boys, but she knows now that every time she gets angry at a little boy, someone else comes along and gives her a belt on the backside, which creates her pain. So she now knows that every time she's angry at little boys, she's also going to finish up feeling some pain. So now there's a layer of emotional suppression. Let's say this child grows into an adult woman. What is she going to feel? She's firstly going to feel her mum's anger towards men. Secondly, she's going to feel very, very shut down towards expressing it. Right? And she won't even allow herself generally to express it. So she'll have this capping emotion of pain if she expresses anger. So she won't express her anger towards men. But, unfortunately, because of the causal emotion, she's going to act angrily towards men. She is going to act out the emotion that is now within her being stored. Does that make sense? Which now creates a whole other group of emotions that God has created in order to correct this system. And this is the group of emotions created through the law of compensation. The principle is what you sow, you reap, right? That principle is the law of compensation. So now, the child, who is now a grown child, but I'll still use the term child, has law of compensation emotions. Law of compensation emotions that have entered her soul that are painful and that will also need to be released. In other words, every time this woman has treated a man badly in her life, she will also now have to deal with the fact she did that emotionally. Now it's like now we've got three sets of emotions. <laughs> we've got the original emotion, the causal, we've got the suppression capping emotion, and we've got because of those two emotions being denied, the law of compensation for the emotions that I've acted out these deeper emotions that I haven't released. Now there's our total emotional pain that is causal in nature. This is the emotional pain that God is interested in helping you release. Do you follow me? This is the emotion, in fact, that 
that when you enter a state of truth and repentance, God's love can flow into you about any of those emotions. So when this lady feels the repentant feeling or the saddened feeling that she's actually done this damage to different men, then God can reach in and help her take away these law of compensation emotions. And when the woman actually goes deeper into that and realises the reason why she's doing that is because she's really, really angry with men, God can help come in and take away that emotion. And then when she realises that actually the reason why she's really angry with men is because of all of this stuff that happened to her mother that was a part of her now, right? And when she starts feeling that, God can actually reach in and take away that emotion. They are all the emotions that God can help you deal with. So we're right up to there. God can help with all of those. They are all actually a part of our system that we can easily release if we have our law of free will, the free will of our own soul being exercised and we truly desire the release of any of those emotions and we're truly repentant in other words, we're willing to feel all of our emotions and we're humble. We have a passionate desire to feel every emotion inside of ourselves. God can help us with all of those emotions. And in fact, many of them can be dealt with in an hour or a day. Does that make sense? So in other words, you can deal with like hundreds of emotions in one week. Hundreds of causal emotions that prevent your connection with God can be dealt with in one week. But for the majority of us, that doesn't happen. And the reason why is because this becomes a castle of pain that's inside of us. And what do we do with castles generally? We defend them. Right? So you could call all of that our quotations, castle of pain. God wants you to deal with your castle of pain. God will help you every inch of the way dealing with all of those emotions. But what often happens now is we start creating a whole group of things inside of ourselves in order to prevent ourselves from experiencing our castle of pain. From now on, we're in the emotions of self-deception. Does that make sense? So from now on, we're creating emotions that we think we have that we don't actually have in order to avoid the real emotions that we have that are even more painful than the ones we're experiencing. And they are our emotions of self-deception. And in fact, we can go even one step greater than that and we can actually, besides creating emotions of self-deception, we we'll call self-deception, just SD. We create intellectual rationale. So a lot of times we can get way, 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 way away from any emotion by doing this, by going into this rationale of self-deception. And what we want to do is describe to you the rationale of self-deception and what kinds of things can actually show you that you're in that rationale of self-deception and what we want to do now is also describe the emotions of self-deception and what kinds of things you do or happen to you showing you that you're in an emotion of self-deception because the truth is if we get out of these states and into this state we can deal with our emotions really very rapidly but when we're in this state we can stay for years and years and years and many spirits, by the way, have stayed for centuries and centuries in these states of self-deception. Peter, microphone. I can talk now. No, microphone, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have it on. The reason why is that it's going into the recorder. Okay. Um, I've got this situation in my life with my mum that I've become aware of. Would you just briefly run through that scenario of the castle in the case of a, uh, a little boy? Uh, where, like, my mother was abused and, and she had this um, pain or hatred towards men, which I've picked up on. Could you just briefly go through this scenario? Or, Can we do that in the... We're having a section of examples of oh, self-deception okay. a okay. bit later in the discussion. All right. And maybe what I would like to do is myself and Mary will spend a, a good hour, an hour and a half or so dealing with these kind of questions where we can actually look at each 
sort of emotion that went on within your mother and then what that created within yourself and so forth and what's going on. Okay, thanks. Is that right? Could I just ask you something too? Would it be dealt with later? If the mother um, didn't deny her anger, yep. if the mother expressed her anger, yep. um, and that had subsequent things, is that something we'll deal with later as well? Or yeah, the truth that is that the denial of anger, I'm not suggesting that her suppress expressing her anger is the solution. Because, the, because remember, anger is also a capping emotion. So her anger is actually a self-deception emotion of what she's trying to avoid even underneath her anger. And the only way for her for mother to deal with her emotion is to actually get to the cause as well. She needs to get down to the cause of why she's so angry with men. When she deals with that, then she won't be angry with men anymore and then none of this would have happened. Does that make sense? So the mother or the parent needs to actually access the underlying causal emotion in order for this entire process to not happen to the child. Right, so even, so if the mother has never dealt with it and has said that she's got it, all of this subsequent thing can still occur? All occurs, automatically occurs. Right. Yep. Um, up the back there. Just on the same subject, so this is relevant to me and my child. Yep. So, and my mother, yep. so my mother denied her feelings of rage toward men Good. and I soaked that up. Does that mean I've also soaked up her causal emotion as to why she feels that way? And because the only way I can release it is to, like her, go to the cause. That's correct, but you, you could say that your anger towards men is actually your parental suppression <coughs> anger. Does that make sense? It's, so that's what's created your anger. But yes, you do have an underlying causal emotion, which is what you also soaked from your mother which you can address inside of yourself. And it, it, it may actually be that mum has been abused even, or it may be that you know, some things happened in your mum's life where her, her mother felt angry towards men and the same cycle occurred down to each generation. So the key for you is just to allow yourself to feel into it. And there's this whole discussion I've had of anger being your guide into deeper emotions. So you can connect to the anger and rage get onto a punching bag or something like that, and then, then actually start feeling your true feelings towards men. And when you start getting into that state, now you're releasing some of the causal emotion inside of yourself about the anger, which will very much mirror your mother's causal emotion within herself as well. She will often, if she notices you doing this, want you to stop that process. Because what has she been doing all of her life trying to shut down this whole process of a release inside of herself. So this is where it's great if you can do it, because if you've got a child, a girl or boy, children, a boy doesn't really matter. And usually, often mums with anger towards men finish up having boys a lot. <laughs> and one of the reasons why is that the boy is what's needed for the mother to actually trigger that emotion. And so often the little boy will be reflecting at you constantly, your own... Constantly. Yeah. And so the key, is, the key is for you then to allow the, the anger to rise but not blame the little boy because the little boy is just reflecting this unfair feeling that he has within himself that mummy's anger is me and I've got no idea why. And the truth is that you need to allow yourself to get underneath that. But we'll talk more in detail about these examples when we get to the examples section because what I'd like to do at this moment is talk more about the general principles and then we can get into real life examples so that you can see what's going on in these different real life examples. Thank so, you. So everyone understands that there's these groups of emotions that God is perfectly desirous of helping us deal with. And then there's this emotion that we create in order to avoid this emotion that we really need to deal with. And in fact, at the top level, we even create intellectual reasoning to stop ourselves from dealing with that. Um, and I'd like to illustrate some of that now. So in this section, you notice there's a section over the page of intellectual rationale of self-deception. And you notice I've said that rationale of self-deception is when the child or adult uses intellectual reasoning of any kind, either fear-based and false or love-based and true from an intellectual standpoint, to avoid an underlying emotion. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this adult woman could say to herself, um, 
you know, I know mum was angry with women, but she's got good reason. Men? Men. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> angry, <laughs> angry with men, but she's got good reason. Right? So, and the truth is she may have good reason. <coughs> like, she may have been abused when she was little by her own father, for example. Don't you think she's got good reason to feel this feeling of anger within her? I'm not saying that it's not an emotion that she shouldn't release. I'm saying she has a so-called good reason to feel it, right? And that's the trouble with a lot of these emotions. A lot of these emotions were created by events. So, for example, if you were living in the Middle East right at the moment, right, and, a, and an Israeli o uh, soldier came into your camp, you were a Palestinian, and shot your children accidentally, right, when they shot a gunman that they were shooting back at them, they also shot some of your children, what would be your emotion? Wouldn't you feel this terrible feelings inside of yourself? You have grief, of course, about losing your own child, but what would also be on top of that? <laughs> Anger and rage. And what would you want to do with that? You may even want to take that to the full extent and actually kill the person who killed your son or daughter, right? That's what you would feel inside of you, perhaps. And wouldn't you say, anybody on this planet generally thinks that that's a good enough reason <laughs> to be angry? Well, in the first century, and now I'm saying, no, it's not a good enough reason to stay angry, right? It's not a good enough reason to stay angry. But most people in their normal state would feel it is a good enough reason. And so what do they do with that then? They fe that festers within them. So what have they now got? They've now got this deep rage inside of themselves towards any person of a certain race. Agreed? That particular race killed my child. That race is like... Like there's this real rage there. And so what does that now perpetuate? Violence, 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 eye for an eye, which makes the whole world blind, right? Which is a quote from Gandhi. So, so what, it, what does it really do for us when we're in this state? We've got to get out of this state and into a loving state. But, so what do we do with that? Oftentimes we go into this fictitious loving state where you're all loving and kind to everyone, but inside you're seething still. And it gets triggered, but you go into meditation and breathe God into you as many of the time the saying is and oh, all of a sudden I feel this nice calm and peace but in reality the emotion is still sitting there still sitting there and the next time the law of attraction happens bang you're in the angry state again and, oh no no I've learnt now that meditation is my best way out of this right so I go into this meditative state breathe that out and I'm calm now and then I learned that actually if I meditate two hours every day I'm st I'll stay in this calm state and none of, no things will bother me so I try that but unfortunately still things seem to bother me not so much but at least I have two hours of nice meditation and <laughs> a feeling of calmness comes over me in that space and I feel I'm growing but actually what I'm doing is actually still holding on to the causal emotion so the truth is that what that Israeli gunman, what that Israeli soldier did was wrong. Agreed? Now I can use that now as intellectual rationale for any of my behaviour. Can you see that? I can go down this track of using intellectual rationale for my behaviour and forgetting it all emotionally and forgetting all about what love is in that process. Or I can go down this track of forgiving him which many spiritual people do. Forgive him, but they still feel angry inside of themselves. And in fact, what I've found is that for many people in this state of rationale, it's when you talk with them, it's like they have this invisible armour force field around them. And you will notice this with people. There are some people you go up to and instead of feeling an emotional interaction with them when you're talking about the different subjects, you just feel total shut down, total block out of anything from entering them. So I remember when we were away, Mary and myself were having a discussion. Mary's lived in Lebanon for a couple of years so, and she's been uh, helping in some, some of the camps there at times and, and so she's obviously seen all of this firsthand. So she starts raising this in a group and almost every single person in the group completely shut her off. They didn't say 
stop talking about this, Mary. I don't want to hear this from you. They weren't honest enough to do that. But what they did was they just closed down emotionally. And then some of them used emotions of self-deception. One girl just said, this is making me sad. I don't want to hear this anymore. And she went upstairs. Like making her sad. This thing is making her sad. She just deceived herself. The truth is that she has sadness within her that it was triggering and she needed to access that. But she believed that Mary was making her sad. The others said, well, what else, you know, we don't want to know about this. What's the point of discussing this? Good intellectual rationale, right? I can't change it, so don't hear about it. How many of you have done that to somebody in your life, right? I know, I can't change it, so what's the point of me discussing it? Right? That is your intellectual rationale to avoid an emotion of powerlessness. Do you see? Can you see how intellectual rationale and then emotions can easily help you avoid some really core emotions within you. And I've just given you just a little example there. But let's look at it, the rationale of self-deception. This is the intellectual thing now going on that helps me to avoid everything. Now, I've given a few examples you notice there. One was um, when a person is stay, saying, oh, I love this person so much. This happened very recently on the internet, which we'll be bringing up as, as an example shortly. Now, I love this person so much, but I kick them off the forum. Right? That's not an act of love. Right? So, love always enables a person's free will. If you're controlling a person's free will, you are not loving anymore. You can convince yourself you are, but that's totally pointless, right? Because you're now in this rationale of self-deception. I'm convincing myself I'm loving, but actually I've been very, very unloving. Does that make sense? We often do all of these things. We can say things like, we can have reasoning that's false. Like many of you have had the false reasoning that if I feel all of my emotions, I'll die. It's a belief you have, right? But it's not true. It's impossible to die from feeling your emotions. The truth is actually quite the opposite. You can completely die from not feeling your emotions. What do you think creates cancer? It's a choice to not feel certain emotions and eventually creates a disease that kills you. Does that make sense? Depression? Depression, is that...? Depression is the complete suppression of all emotions. So these, a lot of these even diseases that we have, like heart disease. How many people in Australia die from heart disease every year? It's the emotion of sadness that is not released that creates it. Does that make sense? Right? While I'm holding on to these emotions of sadness, I am creating these physical things that kill me. So the truth is, is if you choose to not feel your emotions, you can certainly die. If you choose to feel all of your emotions, you're not going to die. I, remind, I might remind you, I'm not saying act upon them all. I'm saying feel them all. So many of us will have an emotion of like feeling suicidal. I'm not saying act upon that emotion, but you can feel that emotion. Does that make sense? So I wanted to clarify that. So I, if I choose to feel all of my emotions, I will not die. But I can have this fear-based reasoning kick in inside of my head. If I feel all of my emotions, I'm just going to die from the experience. It's going to be so painful that I'm just going to cark it. And I don't want to do that. So that's my rationale to not feel. That's my rationale to control the feeling. That's my rationale to get away from the emotion. And unfortunately, that rationale is also disconnecting me from God. Now, I could also have a rationale that's very true. For example, here's another one. If I will lose some or all of my friends if I feel my emotions. Well, yes, you may lose some of your friends if you tell them the truth about how you feel about them. So one of your friends comes up and is, you know, the, the friend that you listen to for three hours and you walk away thinking, gee whiz, that was a total waste of time. I don't know why I did that, right? Um, you know, like, I just sat there and sat there and they just rambled on and rambled on about all these things that I just, like, honestly. And then what do you do? Instead of telling them the truth, what do you do? Uh, you try to avoid little times with them, right? You try to manipulate your life so that you can stay away from 
that particular friend. You like them that, and you can feel some core things within them that are beautiful, but they just seem to do something to you that sucks all this energy out of you and you feel so depleted at the end that you feel like, oh, I can't handle this. Now, do you think the moment you tell them the truth, everything's going to be very rosy? <laughs> Obviously not, right? Obviously, many of you believe it's going to get worse. Actually, I feel it always gets better. The truth is that the truth always sets you free. So the truth always makes things better. But many of us believe that's not the case because we have this initial counter-reaction. And you know what the counter-reaction is all about? It's all about the fact that we've lived in the lie for such a long time that now when the person hears the truth, they're feeling the full effects of the lie that we've lived in. It's a bit like, for instance, you've got a husband and a wife together. The husband treated on the wife 10 years ago. Right? Never did it since, but 10 years ago, he cheated on his wife. They've been together for 20 years. What do you think one of those first emotions the wife's going to feel when the husband feels the truth enter him, like feels the connection with God and feels he's got to tell the truth? So he goes up to his wife and says, actually, 10 years ago, I cheated on you with this woman. Now, of course, he's going to be afraid, isn't he? But what is he really afraid of? The effects of his own lie. The effects of his own action. He doesn't want to actually reap the consequences of what he sowed. But God's telling you, you are going to reap the consequences of everything you sow. Can you see the difference? We don't want to reap the consequences of anything we sow generally. But God's saying, you're going to reap the consequences of everything you sow. So this man, as soon as his wife now gets angry, he says, what, 10 years, you know, and she might go off and she might get really upset and she might leave him for a space of time and then recognise that she's at, go through the process of forgiveness herself. And, you know, there might be lots of things come up and then his causal emotion will get triggered as to why he cheated on his wife 10 years ago, what was going on within him and if he's really owning his emotions, he'll get into that. Now that process might take a year or two years of very, very tumultuous emotions. But do you think they're going to be in a much loving space, more loving space when they're done? Of course. She will be in a space, whether she's still with him or not, of forgiveness if she does it God's way. And he will be in a space of actually working through repentance, the reason why he did it in the first place. And if he does it God's way, that will have all have left him. And now they have the opportunity to have a truly loving relationship rather than a false relationship that they've had for 10 years. Can you see that I've had a false relationship for 10 years? Because 10 years ago, if he had told her then, she may have decided to leave him then. Like, so she might have lots of emotions of like 10 years of wasted her life and all sorts of things may go on for her hearing this truth. But it's the result of the error that creates all the pain. If the man never cheated on her in the first place, does she need to go through any of those emotions? Well, if the man never cheated on her in the first place, there's a high likelihood she doesn't have a law of attraction with a man cheating on her, which comes from her childhood, and so probably not. Right? But if the man did cheat on her, she has a law of attraction relating to men in her childhood that she needs to work her way through and deal with that emotionally. So in the end, she would not experience the additional 10 years of pain that comes from knowing the truth of it. So the truth always helps us to get to underlying emotions and it always is beautiful. The trouble is that many of us still have the belief that the truth isn't beautiful. That the truth actually means I'm going to lose things. And so the truth is, yes, you may lose your friends when you get into emotional truth. The truth is you may lose your partner when you get into emotional truth. The truth is Many of your children, when they hear that something you did when they were children that they thought somebody else did and they hear that you did it, many of them may get upset with you for a period of time and you may lose them for a period of time. The thing to remember from God's perspective is nothing is permanent. Everything that God has made is going to eventually bring all of us back to God at some point. So there is no reason for me to feel, fear the truth. But I can use the truth in order to get away from my emotions of these causal emotions. I can use the truth in rationale 
to get me away from my emotion. So I could say, oh, I'm going to lose friends if I deal with this emotion, so I'm better off not dealing with this emotion. And all you're really saying is that your friends are more important than God. That's really all you're saying, but you don't realize that truth, right? The truth is God's more important than anything in your life. If you treat, it, if you treat God this way, you'll eventually become at one with God through desire. Right? But as soon as you believe something else is more important, you can't have two masters. So whatever this other thing is more important that you're sacrificing is actually now stagnating your progression towards God. So it might be money might be stagnating your progression towards God because I'm not willing to be in a state of truth and I use this emotion, this rationale of self-deception which is, oh, I've got a really good life now. I've got a really good you know, house and car and everything. Like, I know that I stole some money five years ago <laughs> to get some of it and if I tell somebody I stole that money, I may even go to jail and lose all of this but no, no, I, so I won't, I, won't, I won't tell the truth because all of this is what I've got now, I feel happy with. What do we do there? We just sacrificed our relationship with God for the sake of quite a number of different things. What other people think of me, what money I have, whether I'm going to go to jail or not, and so forth. Would I do that if I was in a state of love? I won't sacrifice anything for my relationship with God. My relationship with God will be paramount. So therefore... If my relationship with God is paramount, I won't go into this rationale of self-deception. But we often even use the rationale of self-deception in our relationship with God. Right? So we go, oh, I feel really connected with God when I lay down and meditate and just tune out of all of my emotions and I feel really good in that space. Uh, how many of you have done that in the past? Like feeling really good in this beautiful space of... Oh, calmness and this AJ fellow comes along and it tells me all this other stuff and, and now I feel totally confused half the time and all these, like, all these emotions start flowing through me and I feel these emotions are within us obviously but this is a feeling that we have right within us that if I can pull back from these emotions I can maintain a connection with God well that's not true either right? because God connects with your soul with your soul conditions all of your emotions, all of your desires, all of your passions are all in your soul and you can maintain a fictitious connection with the universe and you'll receive pranic energy from the universe, you'll receive the energy of you know, re re regeneration from the universe, you'll even receive different connections from spirits helping you out in that state but you won't have a connection with God and at one time in the future you'll come to recognise that. So the rationale of self-deception is really insidious and it's one of the biggest causes of us getting out of our emotion. So how do we recognize that we're in this rationale of self-deception? What happens? How can we notice ourselves doing it? So that's a good question isn't it? Because we want to avoid doing it if we're on the divine path, if we're on this path to one with God, we want to avoid deceiving ourselves. So I've got how to know when we're deceiving ourselves intellectually, you notice in the outline. One way is by noticing that or getting or receiving comments from others that often they feel that we are fake with them emotionally. Does that make sense? Now, to do this, you've actually got to be open to hearing what people feel about you. And it's lovely to ask at times what people feel about you. Because, uh, and in fact, I, at the beginning of my own progression this time, what I did was I focused on asking people what they felt. And often I was like, then I took on their feelings, which obviously isn't the right thing to do either. And I'm not suggesting doing that. But what I'm suggesting is, do they feel blocked towards their interaction with, with you emotionally? Do they feel that you're all in your mind or do they feel there's heart in the interaction? Passion in the interaction? Desire in the interaction? What do they feel? Right. And most of my friends, like 13 years ago, would have, if I'd asked them that question then, would have said, they like me, but they can't connect 
to me. And if you have that happening, there's a high likelihood you, you've got lots of mind things going on to avoid you being emotional, you being expressing your desires and passions and your joys and even your sadness as well. What else is there? They often feel that we're being emotionally condescending towards them. Usually a person who's in this rationale of self-deception is also in this place where emotions aren't very important. Emotions, in fact, are weakness. Right? How many of you in the past have felt that emotions are weakness? Right. Yeah, so quite a lot. So if we're uh, like, and, and many men, by the way, feel this way about women, right? That, oh, you know, here she is again, emotions going off. Is it, is it, is it PMT time, dear? Like, you know... <laughs> That is very condescending. Can you see that? The reason why it's condescending is because it's actually saying that if I've got an emotion, I've got a problem that needs to be fixed in some way and it's not a real thing happening, a real transaction. The truth is our emotions are our only real transactions. Our desires, passions and, des and, all, and intentions are our only real transactions from God's perspective and our intellect is so unimportant compared to those things. But often we feel the opposite way and that is that our intellect is very important and anybody who's emotional has a weakness. Now how many of you when you were children was it said to you, you're too sensitive? <laughs> how many of you? Uh, the majority of the audience. So, so you're too sensitive. What, what is that really saying? The parents really saying sensitivity is a weakness. Is sensitivity a weakness? No. When you're sensitive, you are actually very much connected with your own soul. And if your own soul is harmonious with love, you'll be sensitive to every single time something disharmonious with love occurs. So you'll be sensitive when a little child gets hurt. You'll be sensitive when an animal gets hurt. You'll be sensitive if somebody hurts an animal or a child and kills it. You'll be sensitive every time because your heart's open emotionally. So a lot of this rationale begins with our parents again teaching us how to suppress all of these types of emotions because of course they've had 30, 40, 50, 60 years of doing that themselves. So they're well practiced in this right, methodology of getting away from emotion. So what they do is they kick in all of this intellectual rationale and the intellectual rationale prevents us from accessing the emotion. The more sensitive you become emotionally, the better it is for you if the sensitivity is harmonious with love. So you can be ultra sensitive to anybody that just projects at you an emotion of I don't like you and then this could be raising an emotion in you I want to kill anybody that doesn't like you. Now that's not harmonious with love and that's not going to help you obviously. Right? What you need to do is connect with the underlying emotions that cause you to feel those things. But the sensitivity to emotion is a beautiful thing. It's the thing that will lead you home in a lot of ways. So, so allow it to occur and stop getting into the rationale. That's what we need to do, stop getting into the rationale. What are some of the other things? We feel drawn into arguments, intellectual arguments, but we can't identify the emotion in the other person that created the argument in the first place. How many of you often find yourself having arguments with your own children? I, 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 I had arguments with my own children. <laughs> yeah. And often, like, we're arguing with our child in a very, very logical way, right? But we're not understanding their emotion, right? So, of course, the argument is never won. And nothing ever gets resolved from it because we're not understanding the emotion. When we're in that place, we are in a place of self deception. Does that make sense? The fact that we're arguing means that we have an emotion being triggered. The fact that this emotion is being triggered, if we go inside of ourselves and feel that emotion, we'd be able to find out the reason why our child is reflecting it back at us straight away. But we often don't do that, right? What we do instead is we argue some logic back to the child. But we don't have any idea of what the causal emotion is in the child, or it would be better to say, based on our parenting stuff, the causal emotion inside of myself that I'm denying that the child is reflecting back at me and other, in order for myself to feel it. So, what often happens then 
is I get into intellectual arguments with people about all sorts of things, but there's no emotional content in it and I can't identify the emotion in myself or in the other person at the time I'm doing it. And so what we often do is we go into this other state, particularly you see this happen with religious persons of all types of denominations. We go into this other state, oh God loves you, it's all right, you don't have to feel this emotion, and we go into that state, which is also a intellectual rationale of, self false, of self-deception. The truth is something's coming up inside of this person emotionally that does need to be dealt with. So we need to connect with that emotionally. We need to help them do that. By arguing with them, we're not helping them do that. Every single time you enter an argument with another person, you are actually avoiding an emotion inside of yourself that you need to experience to be closer to God. Right. Or even to be closer to myself, or to be closer to that person. Every single time I enter an argument with another person, I'm now avoiding an emotion inside of myself that, will pre that prevents me from getting closer to God. So if I find myself doing this intellectual game thing, and a lot of times the intellectual games are so insidious, which we'll see when we go through some examples, myself and Mary with you, you'll see they're so insidious many times that, that we hardly even recognize ourselves doing them. So this is the rationale of self-deception. Another thing we often do is we always blame others for our own personal law of attraction. So what we might do, we drive along in the car, somebody cuts it off, we say, stupid idiot. <laughs> law of attraction says, I created him cutting me off. That's what the law of attraction says, isn't it? I created the event through an emotion inside of me that needed to be triggered in that particular instance. So if I'm now labelling him a stupid idiot, I'm now out of harmony with my own law of attraction, in denial of my own law of attraction, and I'm using some rationale that he's an idiot for the reason of why this event occurred. The truth is that event did not occur because, it, because he was an idiot. It occurred because I have an emotion in me, maybe it's an emotion that, you know, of fear about you know, having my life harmed. Maybe it's that emotion. Maybe it's an emotion of having my life impeded, you know, like somebody stopping me from doing something I want to do. Maybe it's that emotion that created that event and I need to feel those emotions. So when I ignore my law of attraction and blame the other person for the creation of my law of attraction, I'm actually in a state where I'm intellectually rationalizing myself away from these, one of these types of causal emotions. You see this happening all the time, all the time. And we'll list some examples, but there's one, there's one big law of attraction most religious people do. Thank you so much for teaching me how to love you more. Like, it is one of the most condescending things you could ever say <laughs> to a person. Because most of the time, what you're feeling inside of you is a deep feeling of annoyance at the person that it happened and then the other feelings come and then you get to this state where you feel so-called thankful but in reality you're not understanding because my law of attraction, it was actually my love for myself through my law of attraction that created that event being drawn into my life. So let's say, let's take it to an, a, an example. Somebody steals from you. Like while you're down here listening to this talk, someone's up there in the car park right at the moment running through all of your gear. <laughs> uh. And what could we say? Ah, oh, Peter should have had more security at the home, you know. Why isn't somebody up there, you know, keeping our <laughs> cars looked after? So what do we do? We have these security officers then prowl around <laughs> outside. What's all that doing? Ignoring my law of attraction, right? So what do I need to do instead? All right, my law of attraction was this is triggering an emotion in me. What's the emotion? I need to go into the emotion. It'll be all sorts of different things for different people depending upon what's happened in their childhood, of course. But I need to go into it emotionally. It'll bring up an emotion. Now when I mention that, how many of you felt like going up and checking your car? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, 
you know, that, there's an emotion there, right, that needs to be felt. So, so we need to allow this emotion sort of rise in us when these events occur. But what we do most of the time is we get upset. Now, that person was unloving. Like, fancy stealing. Doesn't he know <laughs> that stealing is wrong? You know, we go down this track, right? Don't they know they're doing the wrong thing? And we're not seeing that it's actually my law of attraction. Now, when I do that all the time, I'm in this rationale of self-deception. I'm actually deceiving myself, thinking that I'm actually in a different space than I am. Jeff, just wait for a mic there. Say you're the person doing the stealing. Yep. Where does that come from? Well, um, if usually, again, there's a lot of rationale of self-deception in the person doing the stealing as well, right? He's saying... You know, they should have left a lot. They should have locked their car, right? <laughs> or he's saying things like, you know, I need the money. They don't obviously need it. It's just sitting in their car. Or he says things like, well, I need the drugs, so I need the money. Or you know, there's a lot of rationale of self-deception going on in the in the motive as well, in the person doing it. But that doesn't matter from our perspective, unless we're the person doing it. Then it matters. So you've started to touch on that, and yep. you've noticed it stopping. Um, is that do you still have to repent as in say truth well to the, the process of repentance we've talked about before in a talk and what that was about remember was finding the underlying causal emotion that causes me to actually want to steal in this case and then releasing that emotion from me so that I no longer have the desire to steal now that, that desire to steal can come from all sorts of different emotions it could be an emotion that I haven't got enough and so I've got to steal from people in order to feel like I've got more. It could be an emotion that I have the right to take things from others. They don't appreciate them anyway. It could be all sorts of emotions and I need to get to the core of that emotion. When I do, the desire to steal will be no more in me. Right. Once the desire to steal is no more in me, then I've dealt with the causal emotion. So when we have a desire to harm others, once the desire is no longer within me, as a, then the act will no longer occur. Unfortunately, many of us, what we're doing is using our intellect or our rationale to prevent ourselves from actually acting upon the emotion. Now, I'm not saying that you should act upon the emotion. So, for example, some of, us may, some of the men in the audience may have this emotion, which seems to be fairly common, that they'd like to have lots of sexual partners. Most of them, what was one we heard yesterday, 21 backpacker and nymphomaniacs. Sorry. That was right, wasn't it? Somebody's ideal partner, so they said to us yesterday, was 21-year-old nymphomaniac woman who's a backpacker. That was his ideal partner. This was a man in his 50s. Um, sorry? No, of course not. No. Uh, emotion of self-deception. Right. But anyway, so, so that's his emotion, right? That's what he felt. That's what he feels. And there's lots of causal reasons why. Some of them have nothing to do with sex whatsoever, right, in him. Now, the only reason for that desire in him to be released, the only way it's going to be released is for him to find out what the underlying cause is. And for him, the underlying cause is this big emotion he has that is totally unattractive to women sexually, right? And this big emotion he has that is totally unattractive to women sexually causes him to project to, at any 21-year-old backpacker <laughs> who's slightly attractive, right, in order for him to feel good about himself sexually as a male. Now, of course, every one of those girls is totally repulsed by him, which is his law of attraction, demonstrating to him the pain he needs to feel inside of himself. Does that make sense? And he needs to allow himself to connect to that and release it. But the emotion of self-deception is, the rationale is, I deserve this kind of relationship. I deserve to have as many partners as I want. Now, from God's perspective, you have the free will to do that if you want. But you're not harmonious with love in that state. Right? And so there will be a reaping of what you sow in that state. Now, many men who are in that state have 
like three, four, five, six, ten children from all different partners. They have a long string of women behind them that are all very, very upset with men as a result of their treatment of women and so forth. And that's their law of compensation. That's, that's what they're reaping. They're going to have to reap that unless they work through these emotions. Does that make sense? So they need to allow themselves to connect to the causal, but instead what they're doing is they've got this rationale going on of I deserve this or I want this and so I'm allowed to do anything I want. You notice also there's... Um, when we're in this state, we're quite sort of painful to be around for a person who's emotional. So how many of you, when you were a child, had this kind of thing happen to you? You were feeling an emotion and it was something maybe that happened at school and then you went home and you started to talk to daddy about how you were feeling and you just got this like a wall from him. You know, it didn't, have to say, it didn't say anything, but it just felt like, I'm not interested in this at all. I don't want to hear this at all, right? How many of you felt that kind of thing coming from your parent, right? Now, what's happening there is your parent was in a state of self-deception emotionally, and they then used rationale of self-deception, which will often be, oh, uh, you know, if it's a male giving advice to his son, who's been hurt at school, it might, his rationale might be, just pop him in the nose and he'll stop. Right? Which is, which is discounting all of this terrible emotion this child has been done from being beaten up at school, right? He's, and it's also saying that the child actually created it, which is not true because the parent did. And it's also saying that the child actually, all of the child's hurt was its own creation. In other words, these people come and beat you up because you're not strong enough, you wimp. That's really what it's saying to the child, right? And so the parent doesn't have to say those words. All the parent needs to do is have this emotional wall of impenetrable wall going on inside of themselves that prevents them from actually feeling the emotion that's being described to them. So m many of us, when we were little children, learned that it was pointless talking to mummy or daddy because they wouldn't feel your emotions. Right? Many of us learned that right very, very young. Because there's this impenetrable wall coming from them, don't you trigger me, don't you trigger me, don't you trigger any of my emotions. You know, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, it's something else. <laughs> you know, and there's all these terrible feelings that a parent often has of like, oh, how do I fix this, how do I fix this? And so they put up this wall that the child can't penetrate emotionally. When they're in that state, they're in a state of rationale, of self-deception. When you're in states of rationale, of self-deception, what you often are doing is you're preventing emotional connections with everyone around you, but you use emotional words in order to make yourself feel like you're actually connecting. So many of you notice people doing this in your day-to-day -day life, right? Where you notice people, you know, you go up to talk to them, they seem connected, but you come away feeling very dissatisfied with the interaction because you were connected emotionally, but they weren't connecting emotionally to what you were saying for whatever reason. So it's another way of actually having this rationale. And what we'll do is we'll pull up some examples of this rationale for you so you can easily identify it. Then the next set of things are the actual emotions of self-deception. How can we recognise we're doing them? Well, one of the biggest ways is by seeing that our law of attraction is not changing. So, in other words, I have a big cry about my own unworthiness. Next week, someone treats me unworthy again. So I have another big cry about my unworthiness. And next week, someone treats me unworthy again. Now, do you think if I was getting at my causal emotion, I would still be attracting the same event? No. So I'm obviously not getting at my causal emotion. There's something else going on, and I'm totally ignoring it, because my law of attraction will change when I deal with my causal emotion. So this is one of the biggest truths to remember in your own emotional work. My law of attraction always changes when I feel and release my causal emotion. 
So if my law of attraction is not changing, then I am not accessing my causal emotion. That makes sense to everyone? It's really quite simple. My law of attraction doesn't change. I'm not accessing my causal emotion. Now this happens to us all the time when you think about it. Often when we have children we notice this a lot because children are beautiful with our law of attraction. They are completely reflecting at any point in time our own emotion. So if I'm getting reflected the same thing from my child every time and I think I'm dealing with an emotion then I need to look elsewhere because I'm not dealing with the emotion that actually needs to be dealt with for that law of attraction to change. So remember in the Law of Attraction discussion I said the Law of Attraction is God's messenger of truth to you on a minute by minute, you could really say a second by second basis. Like last few weeks, a few weeks ago I went through this spate myself of having a heap of leg injuries on my right side of my body. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd fell over, I fell over as I was getting in the shower right? and scraped up all one leg, right? And, uh, and damaged the bone a little as well and whatever and it's taken a little while to heal. And then my heel cracks open and then my, you know, I'll get another few scratches. I go out working in the garden and guess what leg I always hurt? It's always this right leg, you know? And so my law of attraction is telling me I've got something going on that I'm not dealing with emotionally. <coughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. And when you, t when you know what it is, if you can tell me, that would be great. <laughs> 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 no, it's all right. I know what it is. It's, it's just that uh, sometimes you feel like that, don't you? Like, you know, you wish you could find out what, what the underlying cause is. So what was it uh, for myself? Not wanting to follow my own spiritual direction. Not, not wanting to be the best I could be in a certain, in the path that I want to follow now. Um, it's all to, yeah, it's all to do with myself. Feminine, masculine, my legs, yeah. Anyway, I can feel that because it's been a huge emotion for me for the last 18 months, right? Where I've just been avoiding, avoiding, avoiding. I'm avoiding groups like this getting bigger because I'm afraid of what that's going to mean for me and for Mary and I'm avoiding all these different fears you know, I'm avoiding the potentiality of my dying again I'm avoiding all sorts of emotions about you know, following my spiritual direction so um, now what I'm trying to do is work through that emotionally so, um, and I don't know if I'll be over it in a year's time but we'll see how it goes so can you see how though everything that's happening to me my creation, I need to take responsibility emotionally. If it's happening again and again, which it is to me at different times, like with my leg, I need to look at that issue because it's telling me over and over and over and over again, telling me the same issue over and over again. When your law of attraction changes, then you know, in fact, I think we should have law of attraction changing parties. <laughs> You know, like, every time my law of attraction changes and it's changed panic, well, we've got to have a party. Like, this is like, <laughs> that means I've dealt with a causal emotion inside of myself. One of these emotions is gone, isn't it? Wonderful. Like, let's have a party. But, by the way, about parties, uh, myself and Mary are thinking of making a divine love party soon. Uh, we were thinking about, well, we haven't done it yet, so just, just an idea at this point. So it's just where we just have a get together and have a dance and have some music and, and uh, whatever. Um, probably sometime in August and September or September. So, uh, spring. sorry, spring. Spring, you reckon? Yeah. Well, it's a bit warmer, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so hopefully have a bit of a party and get that going. But that's a different subject. I think we should have law of attraction parties because that's a proof that you've dealt with a causal emotion, and it's a beautiful thing when you've dealt with a causal emotion. Uh, microphone. Thank you. Um, when your law of attraction is, you know how you're saying it's physical and you're, you know, it's coming through physical, if, you know, the same emotion keeps coming through, say somebody keeps mm -hmm. bringing up anger or sadness, is that also your law of attraction telling you that you've got anger, at sadness, 
whatever inside that you need to uh, do? Not with? always, no. It's like, see, oftentimes we think if someone's angry with me that it's got anger inside, I've got anger inside of myself. Do you follow that? Like a lot of times you're told that on a new age type path, right? The truth is that actually someone might be angry with you because you have a terrible feeling of that you've got to actually placate anyone who's angry inside of yourself. Does that make sense? In other words, you're afraid of their anger. So, so for example, people can often come to you and be angry with you not because you're angry, but because you're afraid of anger. And what that the, your law of attraction is, you're afraid of anger, so you need a person triggering your fear about anger, right? So an angry person comes up, yells and screams at you, and you get into your fear about anger if you're dealing with your law of attraction. But you, when you start looking at, oh, am I angry inside of myself? Am I angry inside of myself? Now you're skipping out of all of that intellectually. See, you need to feel the event. So when, when, when somebody's angry with me, I feel the event. So, so I get this barrage of anger, and I go straight away generally into some really core emotions of sadness and so forth inside of myself because I can see actually that most of the time I've attracted their anger because I'm afraid of what their anger might do to me. Does that make sense? So I, so I get into, I have had times in the past where I've got into this really terrible terror-based feeling that I'm going to die if someone's angry with me. Does that make sense? And I need to feel that emotion. Once I feel that emotion, I don't attract anyone angry with me again. So, like, when I was away with Mary overseas, I went through this emotion with women, where lots and lots of women were just really in a rage with me, right? But not only just in a rage with me, they would, like, in my face in a rage with me. <laughs> and and so, so I went into my room for a couple of days, and Mary helped me identify what the emotion was, and then I went into the emotion itself of feeling so afraid of women and, and, and what they could do in their rage. You see, in, in the first century... Women in a rage caused me a lot of trouble and I had to work through a lot of that emotionally. I nearly died a few times because of women in a rage and so I had this terrible panicking fear about women's rages. Right? And once I worked through that emotion, I felt this really strong feeling within me of, actually, I don't want to feel... I don't feel like I need to put up with women's rages anymore. And not only that, I could actually talk to the women about their rage when they are in the rage without feeling any fear at all. So they could barrage me with rage and it didn't have any effect on me. I was still firm for the truth. Does that make sense? So I dealt with the causal emotion. It took two days of vomiting and then um, a few other things to occur um, before I dealt with that emotion, right? But eventually that emotion came out of me and then I went up and confronted all of these women not angrily or anything, but I did it in love with all of their rage. The it's not really a mirroring no, it's a sympathetic attraction is what I would call it. Sympathetic meaning that not, it's not necessarily like attracts like. It is that one emotion is sympathetic with the other. Does that make sense to everyone? So, for example, a woman who's, in an ang is, who's angry with men would find it very, very difficult to live with a man who's angry with women. <laughs> Can you see that? Like if, one, if the man was angry with women and the woman was angry with men, do you think they'd last long in a relationship? No, give them 10 minutes, probably. <laughs> they'd be at each other's throats. So, but if the woman is angry with men and the man thinks that he deserves women's anger, now we have a law of attraction occurring that's a very sympathetic relationship. In fact, relationship like that could last 50 years, couldn't it? Because the man would be doing everything the woman wants and, and so she'd think, I, I've got the ideal man. No other, every other man's a bastard, but he's really, really good. And, and he's only good because she does, he does everything she wants and he only does that because he's so afraid of doing anything different. Do you see what I'm saying? And I've spoken to many spirits in that state who are still in the spirit world in this state where... One half of them has been projecting one emotion, one half of them is projecting the other emotion, and because the emotions are sympathetic in nature, they cause the attraction. So that's what, it, that's what the law of attraction works upon. Often, though, law of attraction also works upon like attractions when we're doing things as a group for others. So you often see a group of angry women get together and all complain about their men. Or a group of angry men go to the bar, right, have a few drinks 
and then to, to tell their stories about their wives at home they don't like or whatever. That's a law as a like attraction. They're not, they're not dealing with any of the emotions in both cases. Right? So all attractions occur through either sympathy, or sympathetic opposite emotions, or com what I would call compatible emotions, or through like emotions, attracting events. Now, if I ignore my law of attraction, and my law of attraction doesn't change, then what that means then is that I am ignoring the fact that I'm in an emotion of self-deception. So, like, I'll just give an example from my own life. For nearly seven years, as I mentioned earlier, every single day, and almost every day of the week, when I say almost every day of the week, there'd be one or two days of the week where I didn't do this because my sons were with me. But almost every single day, for seven years, I cried for the first three hours of every day. What I would do is I'd get up and I'd write a letter to the woman I thought I loved at the time, right? And I'd cry the entire time I'd write, which, by the way, she never read, but I would write and write and write, bringing up all these emotions that I felt about this woman that weren't being reciprocated. The next day, I would get up and I would do the same thing again. The next day, I would get up and I'd do the same thing again. And I did that for years of my life. And uh, trust me, you don't want to do that. It was a terrible, soul-destroying like, thing to do. And I was in total self-denial the entire time. Mary, you want to comment about my self-denial? No. no. You need Mike. I just thought it might be helpful to talk about what the self-deceiving emotions were and what you're actually avoiding causally during that process. Yeah, what my self-deceiving emotions were, were this woman doesn't love me, this woman doesn't care for me, she doesn't want me, you know, all those kind of emotions. They were all emotions, of, they were all true. She didn't want me, she didn't love me. <laughs> they were all true, right? But I was deceiving myself as to what my own emotion was. What my own emotion was was missing my soulmate so badly that any woman who faintly resembled what my soulmate would be, feel like, I wanted to have a relationship with. Right? And I just didn't want to grieve for my soulmate because the pain of that when I began it hurt so much that I kept flicking out of it all the time. And it's taken me, it took me after I recognised that, it took me a further three years to actually release that pain <coughs> because I kept wanting to get out of it into the emotion of self-deception. Once I'd released that pain, like that's when I attracted my soulmate into my life. And even when I'd done that, there were still further emotions surrounding that that I needed to deal with that were triggered. So people often do this in relationships where they get fixated on this partner and how much they've hurt me and all of these things when really that is a law of attraction event for the deeper causal that daddy didn't love me or I didn't, you know, as a woman, I don't feel such and such or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah. I'm never going to be a good woman. Someone's not going to love me as a woman and a lot of very, very deep causal emotion related to her father uh, and, or, or the way her ma mother felt about her own father. So, yeah, there's a lot of things like that that we need to remember with all of this. It's all to do with the fact that we create the self-deception in order to feel, to avoid the bigger underlying causal pain. Right? And so uh, once I recognised that myself, that was the main thing that I did it with, that soulmate emotion. Once I recognised that myself, it was really easy for me then to start getting into causal emotions. Right? Because I could see all the patterns in my life of where I was trying to skip out of the causal emotion by having other emotions. So even emotions like the emotion of unworthiness I've recognised for myself was largely an emotion of avoidance of some causal pain. I don't want to take the mantle, if you like, of what God has given me. So that's a big causal emotion. I don't want to do that because I might die doing it. That's a big causal emotion. 
I don't want to feel that causal emotion, so I say, I'm not worthy, or I say, I'm not ready. How many of you have felt the desire to teach others the truth that you're now learning and then told yourself, I'm not ready? Mm. It's a self-deceptive emotion. You're actually ready. You just think you're not ready because you can avoid doing it then. <laughs> can you see? Thanks, Lily. <coughs> Up the back there. Thank you. Hello. Um, can you ever get divine love when you're in an emotion of self-deception? No. You can't receive divine love in an emotion of self-deception. Obviously, what, obvious reasons, there's obvious reasons for that, isn't there, when you think about it. The emotion of self-deception is not a causal emotion. Remember, it's causal emotions that prevent the flow of divine love. So if I'm, so, so if I'm re relieving, releasing emotions of self-deception, so I think I'm releasing an emotion by experiencing it, but it's actually a self-deceiving emotion, God's love can't flow into me because the causal emotion is the thing preventing God's love from flowing. Does that make sense? It's not the deceiving emotion that prevents the love from flowing. It's the causal emotion that prevents it from flowing. So unless I get into the causal emotion or the capping emotion or the law of attraction emotion, law of compensation emotion, one of these three emotions, unless I get into them, I will not be able to receive divine love on that particular issue. So I'm not saying that I'm not going to be able to receive divine love on other issues that I'm dealing with, but on that particular issue... I won't be able to receive divine love in its fullness until I've released the causal emotion, not the emotion of self-deception. Does that make sense? Yep. Mary? I, I just wanted to point out that that's why this is such an important discussion. Yeah. Because so many people, and myself included, when we start on this path, we start connecting with our emotions and crying and crying and then, then thinking, why isn't anything changing? What's happening? Where's my connection to God? Yep. And it's all because we're stuck in this cycle of self-deceiving emotions yep. that actually double up our process in terms of processing. Yeah, yep. and in fact, they make our process so long that we can go for years in that state and not even have dealt with one emotion. And it's so sad because we, we can go for a year, a year of... Someone said, oh, no. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, you can go for a year of processing emotion and then realise, wow, I never dealt with a cause in all of that. And that, for me, that was like a just an amazingly terrible place to feel for the time that I felt it. Like that I'd worked for seven years on something that I thought I was releasing and I hadn't begun. Right? So if you can picture that, and picture it, like, like I said, three hours a day. And Mary knows when I say I'm pro-crying for three hours a day that I've been crying for three hours in a day. So imagine that. Like, and then coming to realise that actually you didn't do anything. Like, the, the feelings that I had after that were just so frustrating. I, I had so much frustration. So no one here has done that. So it's really good news that you're telling us now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so none of you have been doing it for seven years at least, have you? <laughs> So, so at least uh, you're learning this information. The information is very important too because it's the castle of pain that prevents all of our connection with God, right? And the castle of pain, God wants to help us deal with. God wants to access it with us. You don't have to do any of the castle of pain alone. But you will need to do every emotion of self-deception alone while you want to stay in that state, right? So can you see why it's so important to understand the difference? Yeah. Helga? Thank you. Um, so what is happening when I, I've, been, I've been working on um, unworthiness issues yep. for about two years, yep. rather relentlessly. Yep. And then I can feel my law of attraction changing and I, you know, have more courage to speak up to men and many, many examples. However... So if, so if your law of attraction is changing, yeah. you have definitely addressed some causal but emotion. But it's coming back. There is more unworthiness and more. And then I address that again. I feel some, maybe I shouldn't say all, but some law of attraction changing. Changing. All to do with unworthiness. Different issues, yep. but unworthiness. But it's coming back. Okay. 
So if we've got this problem there, we've got one emotion of unworthiness. And unworthiness is a huge emotion on the planet. And there will be many times when the emotion of unworthiness is actually a self-deceiving emotion. And there will also be many times when it's a causal emotion. Yes. And this is the trouble, <coughs> is that so many of the self-deceiving emotions actually look the same as causal emotions. But they don't change my law but of attraction. But they don't change your law yes, of attraction. but I do have lots of But changes. if you have lots of changes in your law of attraction, it just means there's different facets of your unworthiness that you're working through. See, every single emotion within us, like if we look at, the, like, if we look at one emotion of unworthiness, there literally can be hundreds of experiences in our lives where, where we, causal experiences when we're a child that have occurred to prove to us that we're unworthy, right? And any one of them that was shut down will need to be experienced. So obviously, with a situ situation like unworthiness, it's going to take much longer for that one to be dealt with than it is to have other emotions that are just sort of one-off events in our lives to be dealt with. Does that make sense? So unworthiness is the emotion of a thousand parties. Basically, yes. And many times the, emo the unworthiness emotion has been created by hundreds of events. And so every one of those events, remember, created a part of that emotion in us. And when we connect to the event, we release that part of the emotion. And then our law of attraction changes a little in the flavor of that event, but not in other events. Does that make sense? Mm. And God's willing to take out all of them and help us go through all of them if we're open to them. But often what we're doing is we're often in emotions of self-deception with them. So I've been using my unworthiness in order to avoid lots of things in my life. So I used my unworthiness, you know, my so-called feelings of unworthiness, in order to avoid actually, for instance, even saying I was Jesus in front of an, a group. I used that for three years. So for three years I wouldn't say who I was in front of a group. Right? And so every group was quite small as a result. <laughs> and everyone in the group would project to me lots of anger and resentment <laughs> as soon as I said it, triggering this feeling until I worked through the fact that, ah, what it is really is that I'm just avoiding saying the truth. And I'm avoiding saying the truth not because I'm unworthy, but because I'm afraid of what they will think of me or I'm afraid of what they will do to me. Does that make sense? And then once I start connecting with those emotions, now I can really process the cause. I was there when you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you remember right back at the beginning when we first met, I was in this space where, you know, I wouldn't say who I was at front up, and the next lesson I wouldn't say who I was, and the next lesson, and then maybe the fourth or fifth down the track, eventually people would be questioning me so intensely, and eventually I'd have to own up to the fact, right? So I was forced into it every time. And then when I was forced into it, lots of anger were projected at me, which was one of the reasons why I was avoiding it. And so in the end, I was using my unworthiness as a way of avoiding this whole other group of emotions which were more painful to me than my unworthiness. My unworthiness was an excuse to excuse me from deeper emotional processing. Okay. Does that make sense? So every time, and this is one of the things we've mentioned in there too, every single time you are excusing, your, you're using an emotion to excuse other emotions, you are actually in an emotion of self-deception. It's an excuse to get away from <coughs> pain inside of yourself. Karen? So just going back to when you were seven years crying, wanting to feel your emotions um, and presumably asking for God's help, uh, like what more can you do? You're asking for God's help. I wasn't being honest with myself. My law of attraction wasn't changed. You see, God can only help you when you're honest with what help God's trying to give you. So, so God's trying to tell me, yeah, your law of attraction is not changing. Your law of attraction is not changing. Your law of attraction is not changing. Like, you imagine every day for seven years being told that message. So, like, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> uh, some of you think I'm clever, but I'm not clever at all. I'm a very slow learner because my law of attraction wasn't changing day after day after day after day after day. And, like, I just have no idea. I had no idea why that was happening. But I'd be praying again, no, nothing changing, nothing changing, nothing changing. And it was because I wasn't listening. So what can you do to give yourself an idea of what's happening? By being honest about your law of attraction. 
This is, amongst other things which we'll talk about in a minute. But if we look at this first issue, if I was honest about my law of attraction, within a month I would have said, oh, I'm crying every day. <clears throat> I'm in this terrible pain every day. And this woman's not loving me now as a result, or another woman isn't. I must be avoiding something underneath this. And if I was honest with myself, I would have been able to find that thing. Because I found it pretty fast when I was honest with myself. Within a day I knew what it was when I was honest with myself. Do you always have to work out what's going on? Like, if you're feeling very sad, can you just not feel sad and... Um, won't, won't the reason for what's going on come out afterwards? Remember, I'm not suggesting to you that you avoid your emotion. So even if it's an emotion of self-deception, I'm still saying you feel it. But I'm saying take notice of what's going on. Right? If, if you're feeling it every day and nothing is changing, then you're not being honest with yourself. Just straight out, not being honest with yourself. Because if you were honest with yourself and you were connecting with a causal emotion, you would actually have your life changing. Like most of you have commented since the time you've met me till now that you've seen quite large changes in me. Most of you have commented to Mary at times that you've seen quite large changes in her even in the last two months. How does that happen? That happens by a person dealing only with the causal emotion. That's how it happens. Now, if you don't notice the changes or other people don't notice the changes in you, then you're not accessing the causal emotion. Does that make sense? We've got to be honest. My law of attraction is showing me I'm not being honest. The biggest issue that we faced is truth, oftentimes. And remember, I've talked about truth over and over and over again. And the biggest issue with truth is we don't want to face truth inside of ourselves. And if you don't want to face truth inside of yourself, you will not find a causal emotion. Does that make sense? Right. We'll, talk, we'll show you some other ways of determining. Just, and then up the back. So what's going on if you have a change in your law of attraction, but then almost immediately it zips back? Mm. When you say a change in your law of attraction... All right, I'll give you an example of what a actually happened. Um, I got the big promotion at work, mm -hmm. and then the very same week, they restructured the department, and the roles and responsibilities that I had no longer exist. So I've basically got a pay rise to do my old job. Okay. What's going on? Well, uh, I th <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty obvious what's going on. Don't you think? No, I can't. You I can't see it. I was worthy for a moment and then I'm back to being unworthy. You've got an extra pay rise out of it for a start. Yeah. So you've obviously dealt with some emotion regarding money. Does that make sense? You're doing the same work and you've got more money. So you've obviously dealt with an emotion about money for that to occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you feel quite disappointed that you haven't got the title. So you obviously have an emotion to deal with about how people perceive you yeah, that, that is sense. not yet dealt with. Does that make sense? Yep. Your law of attraction is just telling you exactly what the emotion is. Does that make sense, Dan? Yeah, it yep. does. Up the back, thank you. <coughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted you to cover, if you will, different ways that we avoid or distract ourselves away from the causal emotions and or the um, self-defeating ones also. No worries. Well, that's what I'm doing now. I'm on that section, which is the section how to know when you're deceiving yourselves emotionally. The point I've covered at this point is our law of attraction doesn't change. So that's one way you know. The second way you know is mentioned first. We are in a constant emotional cycle of pain. So if you're feeling that, you're in a constant emotional cycle of the same pain, then you are not yet dealing with the causal emotion. You're dealing with an emotion of self-deception. Like, for example, I keep crying all the time because nobody loves me. And the truth in my life is nobody loves me. So I cry that nobody loves me and nothing changes. 
So is that the causal emotion? No. There's something under that, underneath that, that you've created the nobody loves me in order to avoid the thing underneath that. That's even more painful than nobody loves you, to you. And you need to allow yourself to connect to that. Third one, we project our emotional injuries at, our, at others. Right? One way you do this, I constantly tell other people my stories. Remember, they've had quite a few examples where people have come up here and started telling a story, and I've said, stop, this is a story. <laughs> Why do you want to tell a story? You usually want to tell a story because we feel unheard. That's a causal emotion. Instead of doing that, we go into telling the story. We tell the story and I stop you. Now, I, now you feel, AJ's mongrel, hey. <laughs> like he doesn't let me express myself. You know, he's harming my free will. No, no, all I'm doing is saying, stop your story, look at the emotion. There's an emotion driving your story. Does that make sense? And it's the emotion driving your story that you need to connect to, not the story itself. And we're always connecting the story, the story, the story, the story, and we tell the story to a hundred different people and we still don't deal with the underlying emotion. How many times have you seen that? You have, how many friends do you have that come to you, like you had a meeting with them last week, had a cup of coffee, you got the story. And then, you know, there was the same story that was got three months ago when you had a cup of coffee, right? The same story that you had a year ago when you had the cup of coffee. Like, what's happening? Same story. It obviously means the emotion is not being dealt with. It's an emotion of self-deception. The person, whatever their emotions they're expressing, they might even be crying when they're telling the story, right? But they are in a motion of self-deception at the time. Mary? Uh, Mary, can I just, just... Mary should be up here with me, but she's still working through that emotion. I am, I am, I've got a lot to say. It's, it, <laughs> it's because at the same time they're projecting at you a need for you to commiserate or to share in yes. their pain and that's the self-deceiving part. Yes, any neediness projection you have at another person is an emotion of self-deception. Because you can do it alone. If I need you to listen to me, I am deceiving myself. If I need you to validate me, if I need you to love me, if I need you to care for me, if I need you to understand me, if I need you to do any of these things, I am in self-deceiving emotions. They are all avoidances of deeper causal emotion that I'm not allowing myself to access. Yeah. Wow, that just got rid of a heap of emotions, isn't it, that I don't need to process? Yeah. That's just like, like there, there was a bucket load there that went out the door. Like, and that's the way it is. This is the beauty of understanding this truth about emotions of self-deception is you can actually throw out hundreds of different emotions that you thought you would have to process and in reality you don't have to process them all because they're not even real. They are what you manufacture in order to avoid the underlying thing. Right? And this is why it's so hard sometimes to process emotionally because we're so much in these deceiving emotions we're avoiding these underlying things. Can I just mention a few more about this point and then we'll ask some questions. If we're seeking agreement or commiseration from others, you are in an emotion of self-deception. You know what you do? You say, yeah, you know, last talk, AJ said, nah, 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 you know, what am I going to do? Oh, I don't agree with that. Like, trust me, there's going to be hundreds of things you don't agree with. So, so I don't agree with that. So what I do is I find all the other people who I want to talk to who were at AJ's talk at the time did you agree with that? <laughs> and they go you know and instead of saying I don't agree with that straight out we often want the other person to agree with me and then I can have that feeling does that make sense? so the emotion that's being triggered is I'm not allowed to have my own feelings until somebody else validates them by having the same feeling as I do so so that's the real emotion that I'm looking for, but the commiseration is, oh, I don't like what was said there. Did you like what was said there? No. Oh, there's two of us. <laughs> that all of a sudden makes it true, doesn't it? Don't you think? Like, the truth is that thousands of us can have the same opinion and it all be wrong. From God's perspective, that's the case. In the first century, millions of people all thought they had the truth 
And there was only one person that did at the time. Right? Just because there's more than one of you feeling the same thing, it doesn't make it right. Can we see that? Okay, so, so if I have the emotion in me where I'm feeling like, ah, oh, if I get agreement from them and I get agreement from them and I get agreement from them, then that makes me right. Then that's an emotion that I need to do with. I am not trusting my own feelings for a start in that state. If I trusted my own feelings, I would not need the commiseration or the agreement of anyone around me. The fact that I'm looking for it means I have an emotion that I'm avoiding right at that moment. Can you see that? So every time you want commiseration from another, every time you want someone to agree with you, have a look at what's driving it underneath. There will always be something driving it underneath. All right, let's have a look at the other one. We feel ourselves to be a victim. All these bad things happened to me when I was little, right? And, you know, that's why I do that now. That kind of thing. That's why I... And then you can finish the sentence. That's why I yelled at my child today. That's why I... You know, all these different things. Far away, dumb. Sorry. Come up here, dumb. <laughs> I, I see a lot of people do this with you when they, um, when you point out an emotion that actually. <laughs> Come on, guys. She can't help herself, right? Like the, you're pointing out to them some law of compensation emotion yeah. that they have. Yep. But they say, oh no, but I've got this causal. You know, you can't be telling me that. I'm, oh, uh, and have a big meltdown. When really, or they're not even feeling that causal. They're just stuck up in the emotion of self-deception, which is really, don't pick on me. I've been hurt. Yep, exactly. That's what I had to say. She's, <laughs> she's going to come up again. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So you can see a lot of times what we're doing is we, we get confronted with an emotion. Many of you are feeling confronted right now, right? And then... And then we, right, we're being told we need to get into these emotions, but because we're even told that, we go into this state, oh, I've been useless, oh, I've been bad, oh, I've been... Oh, all this self-blame stuff, right? That's here. When you're in a state of self-blame, unless it's a childhood feeling, you are actually in an emotion of self-deception. Right? I'm terrible, I'm bad, I'm not terrible. Well, you know what that does? It just gets you away from having to deal with... Like, I'm bad, so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It gets you away from having to deal with the underlying causal emotion, in most cases. Blaming of others, sorry, Jen, but blaming of others is another thing. When I blame another person, what am I just doing? I am saying that none of this inside of me creates that. <laughs> what creates it is their stuff, right? So what am I doing? I'm deceiving myself about my own emotion that created it. Remember, everything you create is your own law of attraction. It's, it's caused by your own soul conditions, attractions. Let's look at a few others because I want to do them before the, gr before the break. So um, another one is we keep on externalising my emotions. And this is part of that. I blame something external to myself in order to get away from the causal emotion within myself that created it. So we see this so much happening in the world today where someone else is to blame for what I'm feeling. I'm feeling angry because you made me angry. You know? I'm feeling sad because you made me sad. You did this, you did that, you did this. That's what makes me sad. Right? None of these things are actually true emotionally. Because when you're in a state of at one moment with God, do you think you're ever going to be sad like that? No. You won't be. So, so if you are sad, then it has to be some sadness inside of you that has to come out. Does that make sense? Yep. All right, let's look over the page. We avoid living in truth in certain situations. So remember, part of the truth discussions that we've had is the truth is a way of accessing these three groups of emotions. The childhood causal, the childhood shutdown or capping, and the law of attraction emotions. The truth is what will access those emotions. 
So for example, sometimes in the past people have asked me about abortions, right? Quite a few people have asked about abortions. This is not an attack on anyone who's had an abortion, but it is about the emotion. So an abortion creates a law of compensation emotion. The law of compensation emotion is created because you've harmed somebody else's free will. There's now an emotion you'll need to go through, which is a part of the law of compensation, or what you sow, you reap, to actually re be f repentant about that, to actually feel a feeling of sorrow about that with inside of yourself. Right? Now, when I say that truth to somebody, lots of times there's anger back at me. Do, do you follow me? Why, why the anger? Because we're now up here. We want to actually get away from the pain of that emotion. Does that make sense? That's all that's happening in that interaction. This happens all the time. So many people ask me a question and then when I give them an answer, they then say, get angry with me for giving them that answer. Right? What's happening there is they're in this emotion. Right? Because they're just deceiving themselves, thinking that somehow I created that some additional pain in them. The truth doesn't do that. The truth just opens you up to this pain. And most of us don't want to be open to this pain because it's like a castle of pain. And so what do we do? We shut it back down again and attack the person who just triggered it. That's what we do quite often. The truth is a major, major way of us getting into our causal emotions. Every time you avoid even acting in truth, you are avoiding a causal emotion. So, you know, sometimes people say, oh, does that mean I have to tell a previous partner that I cheated on him? Well, if you were living in truth, why would you even ask that question? Of course tell your previous partner you cheated on him. <laughs> like, if they care now or not, it doesn't matter. You need to do it for yourself. Just by raising the question, you've shown inside of yourself that you've not yet dealt with the law of a compensation about the emotion. Because you wouldn't even ask the question in the first place. That question wouldn't even popped up into your mind if you had dealt with it. See, when you deal with a causal emotion, it no longer comes up for you as an emotion. It no longer comes up with you as a worry, you know, like that little anxiety within the soul. When you deal with the causal emotion, that anxiety in the soul just disappears. So if you're asking the question, there must be the bit of the anxiety in the soul which is still connecting you to the emotion. So by all means, go ahead and do it because when you do, you'll connect to the emotion. The truth accesses all emotions. That's why the truth sets you free. Once you're free of all of your underlying painful emotions, how free do you feel you're going to be? It would just be wonderful, wouldn't it? Imagine walking through life without a single negative, fear-based emotion in every single interaction. You're truthful with every single person you meet. It doesn't matter what their reactions are. None of their reactions actually harm you or you, f you don't feel any pain from their reaction. Even if their pain causes them to cause you pain and you still don't feel any pain about it. That's the place you can be if you feel all of your own emotions and if you access these emotions. That's the place of atonement with God. So that's where you're headed. To get there we need to embrace our castle of pain really right? but the rationale of self-deception and the emotions of self-deception just cause us to get out of embracing this real pain that we have inside of ourselves well, one other thing I'd like to mention is the creation of emotional drama you see once we learn that on the divine love path if I'm emotional I'm connected with my soul I then have a tendency to go into emotional dramatization. <coughs> you even have some kind of therapies now that actually do this, where they actually dramatize an event that occurred in your life in an order to actually connect with the emotion. Right? And we do this in our own lives many, many times. The problem with this is that it doesn't get to underlying causal emotion, you just stay in the drama. And so many of us finish up staying in the drama of it. 
staying in the drama of it, which is what I was doing for a lot of years myself, staying in the drama of it rather than connecting to the causal. When we stay in the drama, we often want to tell other people about our drama. Can you see that that would be often a motive? You see, it's no good having a drama that nobody watches, <laughs> is it? Can you see that? And so what we do is, if we're in our own little drama and we're, not, and, and we're not really feeling our causal emotion, because the truth is when we feel our causal emotion, we can hardly even remember the drama afterwards. Like, to be frank with you, I don't even know what emotions I dealt with last week. I can't remember them. Often it's only an interaction between myself and Mary and someone we're discussing that I can, oh yeah, is that, what, can you remember what I dealt with that time? You know, like, because what, because your memory of the, dra of the emotion, the underlying causal emotion, even leaves you. That's what forgiveness is all about. The memories actually leave you, right? Now, it, often what we do instead of that is we stay in this place of drama. This place of drama needs an audience. Right? So what do we do? We write out all of our emotional drama, put it on the internet. Or we write out all of our emotional drama and, and write it as a story that we publish as a book. Or we write out all of our emotional drama, right, and we do lots of things with it. Or we start talking about our emotional drama with everyone. I'm not saying don't speak about your underlying causal emotions. What I'm saying is be very wary that if you're needing an audience, then there's a high likelihood that you want the drama and you want the audience. And why would you want that? because you want attention, right? You want the feeling, this childhood feeling. The real emotion is that I never got any attention when I was little. That's the real emotion that I'm not feeling and instead I'm creating all this drama in order to get this attention. Does that make sense? So those are some of the tools that we use. I'm just going to stop comments because we're going to have a break now. After the break, what we're going to do is um, myself and Mary will actually get uh, a lot of comments that have been made on the internet. Well, firstly, we'll talk a bit more about our own personal lives with you. And then we'll talk about some things on the internet that we've noticed where different people are in certain dramas or in certain emotions of self-deception. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll get sort of the pattern or the picture of how to tell whether you're in emotional drama or you're really just <coughs> facing the underlying causal emotion. So, should we come back... Uh, Four o'clock, let's say. How's that? <laughs>